that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. Spectacular vernacular, I happen to excel at. Aggressive when expressing with the message, so they fell back. I'm gifted and prolific, roof tickets, I don't sell that. I hurdle over slow moving turtles, leaving shells crack. Dominated all who waited for a chance to battle me. Casually causing a new collection of casualties. My bright light shines behind brick walls and canopies. It's the fire that inspired my most recent masterpiece. Yet another magnum opus, here's the dopest document. Here on a sphere that shit by 7 billion occupants. If the mind is money, the mind is the greatest opulence. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the shit that I'm perfecting. I'm just writing and reflecting on the
Um, and again, this was in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. Right now, he he runs like this high scale, like you know, men's barber shop, and he's got this clothing line called Black Excellence. He's he's doing the most. But mm-hmm. at that time, we were both in high school together, and uh, he had an Insonic SQ2, which was a sequencer mm-hmm. synth. Mm-hmm. And you know, I had the Roland S50. We had a Tascam Porter Studio with 424. Oh, and- magic time! Exactly right. <laughs> so like. We're in high school, skipping school, you know, the the homie cut hair. So like he was making money on the side and we were just like, just, just making music. And it was, it was beautiful, you know? Mm-hmm. So I already had kind of a foundation once I got to LA. And I remember when I came to LA, I had like a 90 minute beat tape of stuff that me and my, uh, my homie Houston had did together. And I ended up staying in South Central off of, uh, what was I at? Basically near like Crenshaw and Adams. So like, you know, okay. this is four years after the LA riots. Um, and I was a young kid from Minneapolis. I wasn't prepared for the thought of being in L.A. South Central. Like, I'm, <laughs> right, right. I'm thinking boys in the hood and menace to society, right? So mm-hmm. when I ended up uh, moving in with my dad, my dad stayed on the same block with a bunch of dudes that, you know, we ended up forming this group called Global Flotations. Okay. And Global Flotations was basically like a West Coast Wu-Tang. You had like 10 Dope. MCs, four producers. Uh, I was probably one of the main producers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the main dude who led the group was a cat named Zagu Brown. Big shout out to Zagu if he's watching, aka Franchise Skinny. Dope. Uh, and um, you know, there was um, I don't know, it was just a dope vibe. You know, we all ended up moving into uh this duplex off of uh, like exposition near USC. So it was like mm-hmm. 10 dudes up in this spot. Well, uh, that's crazy dope though. Yeah, making beats, <laughs> sleeping on the couch. I remember yeah. my bed was like this lazy boy. I claimed the lazy boy recliner. <laughs> that's probably still messed up from sleeping on it. But it, it was dope because that's where I really like kind of honed the skill. It was like dudes were making music nonstop, you know, and I was mm-hmm. making four or five beats a day, recording multiple songs. I was like the main engineer in that case because I was always right by the four track. Yeah. So it was dope. It was really, really dope. But at the same time, I was young and I was 16 and I was kind of shook by being in L.A. Mm -hmm. And I was around a bunch of like alpha males and didn't really know how to like be in that. You know, Mm -hmm. so so for me, music was my safe haven. So it was like no matter what was going on, blunt smoke, shrooms, whatever, sherm, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I'm making beats. all Right. 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 And for me, it was great. Like I look back on that. Because L.A., you know, at the time and not at the time, but just in general, L.A. is a hotbed of creative activity. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of really incredibly talented people there. And L.A. is very cutthroat because there's so many talented people all reaching for these same limited resources. Yeah, of course. And that's the that's the big thing. Like, you know, people uh, like you, I'm going to go to L.A. and make it. Everybody in L.A. comes to L.A. to make it. The people in L.A. is there to make it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And it's a trip because, you know, it's it's. If you're in L.A. and you just get there, it's maybe kind of hard to realize how many people in L.A. aren't from L.A. Mm-hmm. And, and came to L.A. to try to get something out of the city, you know. Yeah. So a lot of people, if they don't know you, they're not trying to mess with you unless they can get something from you. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. G-Pack for life. Oh, good looking out. That's yeah. how you feel. I appreciate you, Phil. I'm glad you're watching. Big shout out. Word. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a trip. So that it was hard for me to deal with that, but it also gave me a lot of like resolve and, and helped me kind of deal with um, the reality of being in the music industry. Ultimately, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's anything that you do that's based on someone else's acceptance of it and approval of it. Yeah. You got to be able to deal with that or you got to be able to not let that affect you. And, and I had to tightrope that for a long time, you know? So, um, yeah. You, so, so that's dope though. You found a way to throw yourself into your art and, so I don't know if you know, but I grew up in Chicago. I've, I've been living in L.A. for 15, 16 years now. Uh, okay. It's crazy how time flies. I, I I mean, you know, time just before you know it, it's all these years later. But I still feel like, you know, I just moved out here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so the the interesting thing about it is that growing up in a culture in Chicago, you know, Chicago is, you know, gang culture and and pimp culture and hustlers you know what i'm saying it's a right. it's a very specific sort of culture especially on the west side where i grew up uh where people talk about the south side being the bad side or the tough side but i know for a fact having been raised on the west side that you know my friends that lived on the south side their moms wouldn't let them come visit me <laughs> on the west wow. side you know what i'm saying right. so the the thought of the environment uh, when you speak of like alpha males and, and just all these different activities going on around you, when I really think about it came down to making music and, and, and rapping and being sort of an artsy kind of dude saved me from 
you know, being for all intents and purposes, a product of the environment. It sounds like that was a similar thing with you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, one of the funniest stories, you just reminded me of this like little, very just quick sort of story, but mm -hmm. um, my brother, I got a half brother named D-Lo. It, it, the, the term half brother just seems so weird and like, yeah. disrespectful. <laughs> D-Lo, if you're out there watching, I love you. I ain't talked to you in, in forever, but I love you, uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> we, we, my brother D-Lo makes music too. Hell of a musician, incredible piano player. Like the dude just knows music, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was out in LA, he was already staying with our dad. We had the same dad. So he's already staying with our dad for, I don't know, four or five years or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had more people, I guess, like affiliated with gang culture than me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not to say that I didn't know folks that were doing whatever, but like, you know, I'd never looked like I could be confused for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and I remember when we lived in L.A., uh, when I was in South Central, we were in a neighborhood. Uh, it was the West Boulevard Crips neighborhood. Right. I was on okay. West Boulevard and it was a Crip neighborhood. And if you went uh, one way past Adams, that was 18th Street Hood, which was, uh, you know, Hispanic gang. Right. Mm -hmm. If you go a few blocks the other direction, you go to the jungles, which is not, I mean, if you live in L.A., you might know the jungles. It's a notorious mm -hmm. blood. It's like a famous long standing blood hood. Right. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't gangbang. I don't have an affiliation like that. But I remember like when, back then when we wanted to get weed, we had to go to the jungles. That's right. <laughs> no I had doubt. to leave the West Boulevard hood, pass all the Crips. And mm -hmm. West Boulevard, like, you know, it, it wasn't like they didn't have that kind of reputation, right? Mm -hmm. The cats in the jungles did, though, right? Yeah. So it's like if you're going to the jungles and these dudes are seeing you come back and forth and you're going in and out of a Crip neighborhood, they're like, what are you doing? Kind of a thing. But at the time, I was growing dreads, right? Yeah, so like, yeah. Fools didn't sweat me. They were like, oh, Rasta, what's up? You know yeah, what I mean? yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where's the weed at? Where's the weed at? And they would sweat my brother, but they wouldn't sweat me. You know, yeah. so it's the same kind of thing where it's like if people recognize that you're not about that life and you're mm -hmm. not interfering with that life, yeah. then usually they're going to give you a pass unless you look like a mark and you're yep. just out there with a bunch of money and, and stuff on you and they're going to jack you. Right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I looked broke and I had dreads and clearly <laughs> I wasn't messing with nobody and I had nothing of value for them to take. Mm -hmm. So I was all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt. I, it's it's a very similar thing, man. I mean, I've literally like, I can remember the gang banger dudes that, uh, I mean, I've, grew up with some of them, didn't know some of the other ones, but, you know, they'd be like, nah, that's that rapping nigga, leave him alone. Go on, go on exactly. shorty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or, right. or spit that verse, now now get out of here. <laughs> you know, it was kind of one of those things. So, so yeah, that that's interesting stuff, man, and I kind of feel like there's those parallels like that. So, how'd you end up from that space getting into a, a place where you were, uh, well, you say you were already beat making and stuff, but then it's, did you kind of uh just kind of throw yourself into the music and get more into that kind of stuff how'd you kind of transition like really focusing in on the music that way i mean it's interesting because ultimately like you know a lot of the teaching and stuff that i'm doing now i guess the seeds for that got sown way back then because because mm -hmm. again i had i had my role in this well at the time once we got to the flotation house right the, the flotation spot we were on a, a street called roland curtis and everybody would come through and, you know, we'd smoke weed or whatever. So fools were coming through and kicking it. And at that time, I had a Roland W30 because mm -hmm. uh, the big homies at Goo, that's something that he knew how to use. And he ended up getting one. And um, but other cats would come through and bring other gear. So there was like an S900. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the SP1200. Uh, I don't know if we had that or somebody would bring it through. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember somebody came through with like an ASR10. And a lot of the dudes who would bring gear through maybe didn't know it as well as they wanted to, or they knew a little bit and they would leave it overnight and I get a chance to mess with it. And then I'd start showing them stuff they didn't know. You know? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> no, doubt, no doubt. For me, I was geeked out on it. So it wasn't a thing of like, you know, I know so much more. Let me show you. It was just like, Oh, this is a dope feat. I didn't realize you could do. Did you know you could do this? Let yeah. Me show you, you know? Yeah. And it just became a thing where I was fortunate to be around folks who knew that I was kind of on some geeky techie sort of stuff. But that before, I was it was cool. yeah, before it was cool, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right? uh, yeah. And and thankfully, like I was embraced for that. You know, I wasn't clowned for it. So you know, throughout the global flotation stuff, we did you know a good three four years worth of like hard heavy music. You know, and mm -hmm. then at that point, everyone started going their own different ways for whatever reasons. And there's all love between all of us now. So it was never like a beef sort of thing. But it's yeah, just, you know, yeah. people grow up, you grow apart. You know, so yeah, no doubt. In in all of that, my main goal was I had this thing in my head like you know. By the time I'm 30, I don't want to be known as a rapper. I don't want to be a 30 year old rapper, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because to me, that seemed like, you know, I'm going to be pigeonholed or I'm going to be put in some yeah. box or something. 
and, so and it's only natural to grow, right? There was a Muhammad Ali said, the man that thinks the same way at 40 as he did at 20 has wasted 20 years of his life. Exactly. And, and it's yeah. true. It's mm-hmm. definitely true. You know, so I, I, and I guess that's the weird thing too, is I always was trying to look forward to the future. Like, all right, if I'm doing this now, where is this going to take me? And is that going to set me up for success another 10 years down the line? You know? Yeah, word. So I was thinking like, you know, I don't want to like expect that I can be a rapper for the next 20 years and that's going to sustain me. So mm-hmm. what, what else could I do within this that has longevity? Right. So at that point, it wasn't even about teaching. It was about, let me just focus on production and let me just make instrumental music. And that way I can work with more artists and more vocalists and do all this different stuff. Um, and that led me to sign him with Mush Records, which was okay. an independent label uh, that was in L.A. The dude who ran it, I think it was based, I think he started it in Ohio and then he ended up moving to L.A. Okay. Um, so I did my first record with them in 2003, a record called Decomposition. Um, and, and I guess that was, and that was all the first thing I did under my actual name. So like all my other solo stuff. And when I was with Global Flotations, I was known as AdLib. Okay. Uh, just because, you know, yeah, I saw that because I was, I was looking at some of your history and I saw that, you know, you did some stuff on the AdLib. So that that's dope. So that's how that kind of went. And then eventually you went to Thavius Beck uh, as, as his name. Exactly. Because yeah. um, because the other thing was that, you know, at the time, Mad Lib wasn't as big as he is now, but he was already well known, super respected. Mm-hmm. And I've crossed paths with the dudes uh, with the dude a couple times. I don't know him like that, but mm-hmm. like he's always been respectful and acknowledged me. So like, you know, he he knew who I was. Right. Yeah. And it was just funny because like Mad Lib was with the loot pack. And I was ad lib, and Global Flotations was abbreviated as G Pack. G Pack, right? <laughs> so wild, like, <laughs> like two right. two sides of the same coin on it. <laughs> it was too much, and I remember like there was this. Hold on, that just cracked me up a little bit. <laughs> okay, no, gotcha. Go ahead. It gets worse though. So there was this B Boy Summit thing right in San Diego, and I went down there, and I just done this project called Save Us, um, mm-hmm. and it was like one of my solo projects. It was a beat project on the MPC. None of the beats were saved, so it was called Save Us and whatever, right? So okay. I go down there and I got this poster for it, and somebody comes up and they're like, oh my God, are you ad lib? And they said ad lib, right? So I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's me. And they're like, could you sign this for me? And I'm like, all right, and I pull out the poster and I sign it and whatever. And they're like, oh, I thought you were mad lib. Like, <laughs> Yo. That's a wrap. I gotta change my name, I gotta change my whole steez, like you know. So big up Mad Lib. I'm sure he's not watching, but I respect the hell out of that dude, and uh, that's why I changed my name. So. No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> and Thavius Beck is your 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 government name. Yep, Thavius Beck. It's official. But it's uh, a it's a it so Thavius Beck. So yeah. pardon me, but, no, I mean, but it's I a dope Thavius name Thavius though. It it feels like a stage name. <laughs> you know what I mean? And maybe it's because I've heard it that way. You know what I mean? As this right. that Thavius Beck is this artist this. The Ableton live trainer, this beat maker, this producer, you know what I'm saying? So it's probably just ingrained in my mind that it's an artist's name. But yeah, not everybody's name has the the ability to become a stage name. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, you know, my mom that's pretty it up. Dope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She 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 got busy on that one. Definitely. Um so yeah, that that's actually dope. So then when you change your name to Thavius uh, your stage name, you went with your regular name, you uh you said you got with Mush Records. Yep. And what was your first release with them? So the first release with them was an album called Decomposition. Uh, okay. And uh, that was like a big departure for me because, again, it was primarily instrumental. Um, I got to work with uh, uh, an artist named Cedric, Cedric Bixler Zavala from the Mars Volta. I don't okay. know if you're familiar with the group, but mm-hmm, at mm-hmm. that time, um, there's like a whole background to it. And, and I, I can't like go much further without mentioning the homie subtitle, a.k.a. Giovanni Marks. Because he basically opened me up to a whole world outside of the global flotation stuff that I was doing in terms of like more dance music, more weird IDM stuff and just like just just other electronic music that was beyond what I was dealing with, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And I ended up going on a tour with him. Uh, He was signed to a label called GSL, Gold Standard Labs. And that label was co-owned by one of the dudes in the Mars Volta. Okay. So he ended up going on the tour, opening up for the Mars Volta for their first like official record um, on uh, what was it on Universal? Okay. And Subtitle brought me on to basically kind of like be his 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 hype man to back him up and like play beats and whatnot. So from there, I ended up meeting the dudes from the Mars Volta. Those cats are pretty cool. Uh, I asked Cedric about doing something on one, uh, for a song on one of my records, and to my surprise, he was like, "Yeah, sure, send me the track, let me hear it." And I sent it to him, and he was really into it. Dope. I I did not expect him to even say yeah, you know, and 
what was cool about it was that like when I was on the road with them, there was a cat in the band uh, named Jeremy Ward. Rest in peace. He, he passed away shortly after that tour. Hmm. And it was really cool because, you know, they're a rock band, right? The Mars Volta is a rock band. Some would say like a mix between Zeppelin and Santana. Okay. And you had this one dude that you wouldn't see on stage, which was Jeremy. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy, at the time, I think he had an SP-303, maybe? SP-202, SP-303. Okay. And he's off stage. Nobody sees him. And he's the vocals and whatnot are running through his SP. And he's sampling stuff and manipulating vocals and doing just, just crazy shit, right? That's wild. And no one knew. Like, if you didn't know, you just were like, oh, those effects are crazy, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> right. And to me, it was dope because, like, Jeremy's whole thing from what I saw, I didn't know him well, right? I got to meet him, and, and he ended up dying, like, two weeks later. So I didn't know wow, him Wow, that's well. crazy. But he made a huge impression on me because his whole thing had nothing to do with, like, fame or notoriety or being seen like that. But he had a massive impact on the sound mm -hmm. like, using this mm -hmm. little-ass sampler that everybody associates with JD and whatnot. And it's like... Right. You know, to me, it was just dope. Like, oh, wow. OK, that's an element in this genre that I wouldn't expect from a dude who's not up front, just like turn the knobs, trying to be like, look at me do this, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So so it was dope. So like that experience made me appreciate what they did as a band more. Um, and asking the to do something on that record was a huge thing for me. So um, and that kind of led to me doing a series of records with Mush where I was trying to get like certain specific guest artists. Mm -hmm. But I had an excuse to make the rest of the album instrumental, you know. So dope, dope. Yeah. Really dope, really dope. So that's cool though. And so did you find that kind of being in in LA at a time when um, you know, there's probably people coming up, but maybe not as well known. And I almost feel like that was a, <clears throat> a a very specific, a special time in that scene in LA. Did you find that that kind of propelled you to create music or the collaborations and stuff? Cause I, if, uh, if memory serves me correctly, when I was <clears throat> reading some stuff, you've been in several different crews or done a lot of collaborative stuff. So was it just that kind of collaborative spirit in the environment at the time? I mean, there was a lot of, well, I'll put it to you this way a lot of what was happening in LA at that time was based around what was happening at chaos network and project mm -hmm. bloat. Okay. And when I came to LA, um, it was project Bloat's second year. I think I, okay. I, I moved to LA right around the second anniversary of project Bloat. That's a good time to move here. If you're going to be an artist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? and, I, and I spent 20 years in LA. So it's like, mm -hmm. at that point there was no low end theory. Uh, the predecessor to low end theory was, uh, uh, what concrete jungle. Uh, mm -hmm. which was a hybrid. There was a hip hop room and then there was a drum, a drum and bass room. And you'd have, mm -hmm. you know, people emceeing over drum and bass. Remember Micah nine was one of like the main MCs there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was dope. But like before all that got started, it was all about project blow. Yeah. And before what was happening to project blow, it was all about the good life. And I came basically at the very end of good life being a place to go. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I remember I went to good life, I think I went to Good Life once and I met a, a dude named Otherwise, an MC named Otherwise. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, we never actually worked on anything together, but Otherwise is really, really dope, super talented freestyler. Um, and he's the one who basically told me about Project Blow. And okay. I remember I went there and it's like, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if you ever got a chance to like really experience Project Blow like at his height. I did not, no. I wanted was, to. I remember being in Chicago thinking, like, I got to get to this. <laughs> Man, just one of those things I never got to experience. So it's dope to, to hear about it. it. It was just a, a very unique vibe because it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, to me, it kind of embodies what I was saying about L.A. before. It's like you got a gang of just super talented people that are hella cutthroat and very, like, competitive and mm -hmm. will not hesitate to be like your shit is whack get off the stage you know what I mean? <laughs> right right it, it was like it was like the west coast apollo basically mm -hmm. but way more intimate you know because it's a much so smaller you stage. know what was interesting when you say that is that i remember like when i first moved out here and i put together a band and i kind of had almost like a roots sort of thing going on and then sometimes i would perform with just me and my dj and sometimes i would perform with the band but what it was an interesting thing that i noticed that would happen people you would almost get a vibe that like people would not like I experienced this thing where packed room performing, get busy for 30 minutes or whatever it might be. And, and, and then like, just kind of people just standing. Right. Right. And then as soon as I get off the stage, people are asking for autographs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was just a, a like I'm like, well, they analyze it because, you know, if you didn't know anybody, you'd be like they the most of these people wasn't feeling this. But like 
it's literally been a situation where my wife has stepped back like, well, you do what you're going to do. You got all these people asking you to <laughs> sign stuff like, you know what I mean? So totally. it's an interesting sort of thing. Like I could see how people would be like, yeah, nah. Right. <laughs> because I felt like, like they were like really intense about the judgment right off the bat. You know what I'm saying? We make up our mind when you get done. Right. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it's funny because I was always the joke about, you know, dudes that would play in L.A. and mm -hmm. get a chance to tour over in Europe. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, the crowds in Europe are amazing. Right. Yeah. Because they're just into it and they're very open. And it's like, you know, it's just a different vibe. Yeah. And you come back to L.A. and that's that's exactly what would happen. Fools would sit there and just look at you <laughs> and they're not ignoring you. Right. No, and they're not they even actively missing you. But you don't get a read. Right. Because it's like they're, they're really trying to check out, OK, who is this dude? Mm -hmm. What is he doing? Who is yeah. he working with? Who right. Produce the track. <laughs> Who's doing the visuals? Yeah. Blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. You know, is this dude a threat to what I'm doing? Should I be concerned? Should I try to <laughs> politic with this dude? Who's his booking agent? You know what right, I mean? Like, right, right, right. We're running through like a million questions as it relates to what they want to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then if the music doesn't suck, it's like, all right, I'll give it up because I might need to work with you later. You know, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you don't really know what the motivation is. You half the audience <laughs> are dudes who are trying to be on stage. It's true. It's true. Yep. You know, so it's. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's it's the kind of thing where like if you're not actively aware of that, mm -hmm. it'll fuck with you because it's yeah, like, yeah. all right, do y'all like this? Mm -hmm. I'm in. The, I still got 15 minutes left of the show. Y'all ain't did nothing. So <laughs> no, I keep right. going, like, you know? <laughs> right, right. No doubt, man. It's a it's an interesting sort of sort of way of of being. So let me ask you this: like there was. Um, when I came to town, there was a lot of shows happening at the airliner and the low end theory was happening every week. Uh, you were part of, you were performing at the low end theory, no? Or yep. yeah, I figured you were. And, and like the airliner was is such a significant sort of place for me personally. And just like in the scene in general, because of the low end theory, and then other promoters had other nights and stuff. Um, you know, so, so what was the experience like playing uh, and being involved with the, the low end theory at that time when, you know, you you talk about um, um, Project Blow for years before, just like you may talk about in New York, there was um, uh, the Lyricist Lounge. So right. you had these sort of things that happen in different regions. And like, uh, what was it? Was it Black Lily in Philly at another mm -hmm. different time? So there's all these things, maybe it was, it's in Chicago, Red Dog or Subterranean these sort of scenes that crop up and how, what was it like deal, you know, being a part of that, that energy and that timeline for, you know, the low end theory. I mean, to me, it was just really dope to kind of see how all this formulated. Like I, I feel like my time in LA was basically a bridge between what the LA freestyle rap vibe project blow good life was into the beat scene, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of in my own way, maybe in my own mind, kind of like a bridge between the two, because I was part of a crew that was like, you know, fools would battle and freestyle and, and just rap and just like whatever. Right. And just the mm -hmm. cypher was about that. Was, that's what it was. But I was the main dude making the beats, too. Right? Yeah. So as a producer and getting more beat centric and the dude who started uh, um, one of the dudes, the main guy who started Low End Theory, a cat named Daddy Kev. Before that, um, the club was Concrete Jungle. And Concrete Jungle, like I said, was half hip hop, half drum and bass. And it was tied to the label that he ran at the time called Celestial Recordings. Okay. And I was signed to Celestial. I had a deal with Celestial and I had a record that was supposed to come out that didn't because the record, uh, the label shut down before the record got released. And there's a whole other backstory behind that. That's for some other time. But uh, <laughs> So because of my relationship with Kev and the fact that I was making an instrumental record and it was more beat centric, I was on the first flyer for Low in Theory when it actually started. I, I played, I think, like the, fir the fourth show there. Okay. And I played probably 15 different shows at Low in Theory. I mean, it was literally like my backyard. Not to say like it was my personal spot, but I mean, like in, it, from proximity to where I stayed. Okay. It was like my backyard, you know? Wow. Dope. Um, and at the time when Low in Theory started, like it's funny to see how popular it got because when the first night it was like 50 dudes. Like literally dudes. I don't know if there's any woman who was there. <laughs> right, specifically. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And if there was, it was probably like somebody's girlfriend, right? So, um, which was fine because it was like a producer's playground. Mm -hmm. What was dope about it was that like people didn't really know yet, you know? Yeah. yeah. So it was a place for us to play beats for each other on a really dope sound system. Yeah, um, yeah that's without a doubt. 
big up to Sam, Big Sam, Pure Filth Sound. I don't know if he's watching Sam XL. Man, the, the low end theory was dope because it was a chance for all of us producers who probably didn't have a dope studio or like good equipment to like really hear our stuff yeah. to play it loud on a banging ass system that could handle as much bass as we wanted. You could Hell crank yeah. that shit. Dude. Yeah, it was it was a crazy system. It would let you know what was going on with <laughs> with the joints. It was Definitely. inspiring. I left. I left. Uh, you know, I, I've gone, I've gone to Low End Theory a few times, but I've been at the airline at a lot of different events and a lot of times left that spot inspired. <laughs> you know what I mean? For sure. Without question. No, it was it was dope. And the homie uh Sharky uh was the cat who uh owned the spot for for years. And Sharky was really cool. I remember I ended up uh you know kind of getting to know him loosely through an old girlfriend of mine. And mm -hmm. you know, it, it was just a really friendly spot, like the vibe was cool, you know. And I always felt comfortable. Uh, you know, Kev, Gaslamp Killer, mm -hmm. uh D Styles at the time, no can do was like the the uh the uh, you know the resident MC um uh elvin dj nobody you know um and it was cool because like these are all dudes that I already knew so it wasn't like i had to show up and be like oh you know can i talk to so and so about you know i always got love there it just felt cool so it was nice to have a vibe like that where you're constantly hearing dope stuff from people that i respected you know and, and i could appreciate the fact that they were doing something unique i was going to hear some really dope bass people cared about the sound and it was about the producer it wasn't about the mc it wasn't about like you know some shiny front person it was like no this is about the beats mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was dope because i didn't I, there had been no spot like that it feels like the way jazz started it feels like the the you know my uncle is a jazz trumpeteer and like uh, uh there was an apartment i had in chicago um was like my first apartment around the corner was a laundromat and a jazz club <laughs> oh. yeah and uh uh, one of the best like barbecue joints in Chicago and like then that. <laughs> and so crazy. Okay. like, you know, my sister would come through, we would go to the jazz club, but we come out smelling like all kinds of cigarette and cigar smoke. But the vibe was just about like us for us. You know what I'm saying? And and I, I kind of get that feeling with low end theory. It was really about us for us. We do this for us. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It was just uh, a dope vibe so that's kind of what it sounds like to me no nah, definitely and that and that's why it was interesting to kind of see like you know again i'm I'm 40 right mm -hmm. so i'm a little older than a lot of the cats that like started coming up through low end theory for mm -hmm. instance like uh i mentioned gas lamp killer flying lotus is probably like the best known sort of like alum of fly, of low end theory i guess yep. you could say you know uh agree the homie db yeah, yeah. And the homie DiBiase, who was already doing stuff for Project Blow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ross G, again, another rest in peace. Rest in peace, Ross G. I, I still can't even believe that dude is gone. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. Uh, that's a dude who I would see around all the time. The whole time I was out there, his whole vibe never changed, you know, because he was yeah. just he just who he was. You know what I mean? It just so happened that people were like, I guess, ready for the sound. And he mm -hmm. was just making the right moves at the right time. Right you know? time. Yeah, yeah. But it's like all of us knew each other. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Uh, me and Ross yeah, are about the same age. Clearly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. So, you know, that was really cool. But like I said, for me, it was interesting because, like, you know, I was doing my thing and I was seeing a lot of these dudes younger, not really knowing, like, what they were about or, like, what their trajectory was. And to just be frank, just to be real about it, like, I had a certain sense of, like, I thought I was supposed to be whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't operate or make the type of moves that I probably should have. I was super antisocial. There's probably a lot of opportunities I could have taken uh, taken more advantage of. So when I started seeing cats like Flying Lotus and like Raji and like whoever like doing more and more stuff, you know, I got kind of bitter because mm -hmm. I felt like I should be doing more and I should be whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. It took me years to realize, like, dude, everyone's got their own lane, you know? Yeah, yeah, certainly. And it wasn't like I ever hated on any of those dudes. It was just the kind of thing where it was like it made me feel a certain way about myself. Where it was right. like, all right, if these dudes have these opportunities. And I'm still kind of operating at the same level. What am I really doing? You know, it's like a mortality check almost like you. Yeah. you it makes you look inward like, whoa, man, am I moving the right way? I get it. I know where you're coming from. I think that's a natural thing for artists, though. You know what I mean? Like it. And, and then, too, I think that we're probably artists are probably more introspective and tough on ourselves than most folks too we're sensitive, man. Yeah, you know what I mean? And that's where the art comes from. I'm sensitive about my shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it makes funny though, is like all that stuff came full circle, you know, like yeah. 
it's a trip because I remember sitting down with uh, with Ross G at uh, one of the Low End Theory festivals. We're chopping up, you know, smoking some weed or whatever backstage. Mm-hmm. And I remember like he had said something about t- to me like, I don't know what I was saying. I was saying something about like some tour or wanting to do something. And he was like, but man, but you're the teacher. Everybody sees you as the, as the teacher. And that's dope. The way that you can spread this knowledge and how you've inspired so many people. And I'd never really even thought about it like that yeah. until he had said it, you know. I remember yeah. another situation where uh, after I moved out here to, uh, to New York, Flying Lotus, uh, the movie Cuso uh, was premiering out here at the House of Vans. And I went out there to see it. I hit up, uh, you know, hit him up because, you know, I got his number or whatever. And mm-hmm. I don't again, I don't know him like that to just be like, yo, what's up on a whim? Mm-hmm. But he's always been cool and super respectful. Right. So I'd hit him up like, yo, can we get into the thing? And he got us on the list. And I go in there and after the movie's over, he's doing a DJ set and he shouted me out on stage, like stopped all the music. Cause I did an Ableton, like he asked me to do like an Ableton thing for him, like back in the day, you know, mm-hmm. an Ableton lesson or whatever. And he stopped all the music in front of everybody and was like, yo, there's the dude who taught me how to use Ableton live. Big up. <laughs> That's what's up though. And I was like, whoa, because because he didn't have to do that. It was yeah. completely unprompted. It wasn't like some fake sort of, it was just genuine love, you know? Yeah. And then, but two, you know what I think too, what comes of that, um, uh... You know, one that's very naturally you just judging without without even knowing anything, just hearing from what we've discussed in this this particular interview that's very naturally you. And you, you I think you'd be surprised at uh, the lives you touch and the people you influence just by doing what you do. You know what I mean? What your your natural disposition happened to fill a specific need for him at that moment. And that appreciation is probably deeper than, you know. Yeah, and, and and the well, not the flip side of it, but I guess the other aspect of it is that it took me years to really appreciate that that has so much value. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and I, at this point now, it's like I, I feel really. I don't know. The, the term "blessed" can mean different things to different people, but I guess it's appropriate here. Like I, I feel blessed that like I can reach so many people, and it's not dependent on this approval of is did he make a dope beat do i like this sample is this loop tight like it's not about that like i I can teach y'all different concepts and ways to express yourself yeah and there's a lot of value in that whether you like what i'm doing or not Mm -hmm. you know and now i feel like it's dope like i've never I, i don't think i've ever like released enough music or touched enough people with like records that i've done mm-hmm. compared to how many people i've touched with like lessons that i've offered you know yeah, yeah. and uh and it's cool like if if you know god forbid i leave the earth tomorrow i'll knock on some wood but if it happens i know that i've affected people in a positive way you know and that's that's a beautiful thing so i dig that <clears throat> i dig that and i could appreciate that and i relate to that because it's a similar thing with me with the b-boy tech report thing and the 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 way I embrace the culture and try to share back and and you know um, I noticed a big difference and you probably noticed something similar but I noticed a big difference in the promoting music and you have people that like your music but that's one thing but then when you flip it on its head and start less me 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 and my music me as an artist me my music me my music right and you flip it on its head and you start to give back to the community and mm. and and the we when it becomes the we that's when things elevate <laughs> you know what i mean and and it's just you know i'm down with that because it feeds the culture and 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 if you can leave something behind on the culture then i feel like it was all worth it Definitely. one way or the other you know what i mean no 100 percent. and it's a, it's funny too because you saying that and again like me kind of peeping like what you've been doing from afar one of the things that I always thought was really dope is like you don't typically see people that are talking about b boy anything fucking with modular stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no you doubt. Just see it, right, like most right. people associate that with you know, and and forgive me for saying this, I don't mean anything other than like what the term typically means. Because mm-hmm. I've been called this before. Like people will see that and be like, "That's some white boy shit." Right? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I remember, certainly. I've at heard Project, it. At Project Blow. Here's a good example. I remember playing some beats and 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 you know, the main dudes, they're talking about, oh, that's some white boy shit. You're playing some white boy beats. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> right, right, but right. It's the thing where, like, if we, we being us of color, I guess, you know, for <laughs> lack of a better term, if we can show that this isn't about whatever, white, black, whatever, it's dope. And if you can yeah. flip it and put your own soul into it and whatever, then you make it your own, you know? That's it. That's exactly it. And and you recognize that that, that whole thing for me is like, yo, 
for me, it feels like this is more hip hop than ever. Like, I feel like this is so. So think about this, yo. The guy who made the turntable. I don't know that guy's name or that person, whoever created the turntable. I don't know who that is, but they didn't make it with hip hop in mind. We right. took it and transcended it, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Grandmaster Flash, being an electrician, created a switch to flip on and off because he's dragging his record back and forth and created this thing. You know what I mean? Roger Lynn, when he created the MPC, was not thinking of hip hop. It was not thinking of anything besides, damn it, I'm a guitar player and I need a drummer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Literally, I know that because I spoke to him. He told me that. <laughs> so and when we got a hold of the MPC, we flipped it. It becomes a hip hop tool. That's hip hop. So when right. I look at modular for me, like this, I said this before. There's a this scene in in James Brown's movie, the uh, autobiography of James Brown, where he's with his band and they ain't doing right. They ain't playing the way he want them to play. And he's talking about on the one. And for cats that make hip hop, it's so fundamental, like the one and funk and all that. But he was trying to explain it in a time when they didn't quite get it. They were musicians, musicians, you understand? Exactly. And he was changing the way they played. And he was like pointing to each instrument. What is that instrument? He was like, a horn. Ah. what is that instrument? It's, you know, a bass. Ah. What is that instrument? He's a drum. That's right. All these instruments are drums. Start on the one and make them play differently. I say that to say this. Modular to me and the way I approach it and the way I end up with the sound in my drum machine of whether it's the force or the MPC or whatever, it's really like vinyl. It's all vinyl. I'm using the same techniques at the end of the day that I would if I just plugged out my MPC 60 and the turntable beneath it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. That that's hip hop. It's all the same techniques. And to me, it feeds the culture and we should never be afraid to. And I think you understand this more so than anybody I think I could be talking to at this moment. It's 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 important for us to push the envelope and it, technology is a part of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we shouldn't be afraid to expand and experiment. Um, some of us will be more esoteric than others, but we shouldn't be afraid to push the envelope. You know what I mean? Like, I think sometimes we've gotten a little too much tunnel vision and we got to be able to expand and stuff. And it's OK at the same time. No, definitely. And, and I think really, you know, I guess that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about like, you know, the whole feeling of not wanting to deal with the outside judgment to get acceptance for what I'm trying to do. You know, word, word. there was a uh, you know, I'm, I'm positive you probably saw it. I know a lot of folks saw it. Uh, there was a uh, what was it? An interview with Andre 3000 was it Rick Rubin. I think it interviewed him mm -hmm. and he was talking about how like he didn't feel comfortable releasing anything and like, you know, that he, he wasn't sure like what he had to say was basically relevant right now to this audience, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And imagine the pressure a dude like that must feel widely regarded as one of the dopest MCs, period. <laughs> All time, right? Yeah, yeah. And what if he wants to make an album of ballads? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? What, what if he's feeling like getting his inner prints on and doing some just crazy left field stuff? He's going to be judged on what he did before. Right. He's and, picking hold. It's like you can't grow like a damn. I can't be me. Right. And that's messed up. Like for someone with that much talent, with that much like visibility, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone would buy his record, but if they're going to buy it, expecting it to all sound like the love below and kill him for trying to try, you know, try something different. Why would anyone ever be willing to experiment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, so to me, I think part of the music education, it's not so much just like, let's teach the gear and let's show that you can do this, but it's like, let's show that there's an opening for people to just be experimental, mm -hmm. you know? And, let, and let's support that. It doesn't all have to be like, that's my favorite <clears throat> song, but it's like, that's dope that you tried that. Yeah. I never would have thought you would have went in that direction. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. Maybe I could try something and borrow some of these techniques and step outside of this 4-4 four, four boom bap paradigm or whatever it is. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with like, I yeah. still love boom bap. I still love a one bar loop. Like, <laughs> But there's yeah. way more than just that. Right. The, you know? and, and, and I think too, creativity needs to be fed sometimes and, and i don't really care who you are whether you bang out a million boom bap tracks a day at some point you might find yourself in a law i always tell people when they like yo how do you get past like creative like when you're stuck creatively and i'll tell them go outside of what you normally do like maybe even go and listen to something that you wouldn't normally listen to or uh, you know what i mean that ain't even remotely related to what you're doing if then it kind of starts to expand your mind like for for me when I think about, you know, coming from the MPC paradigm, there's no probability, there's no trigs, 
You know what I'm saying? There's none of this kind of stuff. And when you start thinking about that kind of stuff and start applying those kinds of things to how you create, because it's different than that, you know, the two bar loop and nothing's wrong with that stuff. But when you start to incorporate other stuff and I find that modular has always challenged me to challenge my creative space, you know, it keeps it keeps it moving and stuff. And, and technology in general is kind of like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. you know, it's, a, it's a trip because now that you say that, it, it reminds me of something that I, I guess didn't really hit me until now. You know, like a lot of the beats that I was making when I was much younger and I was into global flotation stuff, that was like the, the, the ad lib sound. I mm -hmm. wish I had like a lot of that. I got like a stack of mini discs and a mini disc player that doesn't work. So, uh, <laughs> classic. But, yeah, Peanut right. Butter, no jelly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it's like such is my life, right? But uh, what was the trip about that is that with the Roland W30, the way that I would sequence my stuff, right? The Roland W30 had a uh, what was it? You had two banks of sample that you could sample into. I think each bank had uh, seven seconds of sampling time, and if you cut the sample rate in half, you got 14 seconds per sampling bank, right? And so all the samples were lo-fi, but beyond that, the um, the way I would sequence stuff was all linear, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't looping anything. Yeah. So if I wanted to make a three and a half minute song, I'm playing the drums for three and a half minutes straight. <laughs> right, right. So I'm doing all the fills live, so th it didn't sound like a loop. So a lot of the beats I was making, even if they were loop based, they weren't really like just pure loops. Yeah. And when I go back and hear that stuff, I'm like, oh, this is dope. This is unique. Why is it? Well, because I had to play the whole fucking four minute song. Right. And right. I, I, I made like a, a drummer you know, would have to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And as you do that, if you're thinking about it, especially if you're the person who's, who might it, or you're a rapper and you can figure out where the vocals are going to fit as you're playing it, you can kind of get the vibe for like, all right, four, four bars in, maybe I could do a fill here. You know, this will mm -hmm. probably be before the hook. Let me do something a little bit different here. And then it feels a bit more like a band is playing, you know? Yeah. So that kind of stuff, I think nowadays, there's so much technology that's there, but so many people I think haven't had to struggle with like stuff that didn't do things automatically. Right. That it's taken for granted. I can get a, my MPC live. I got sitting here. If I didn't disable the template stuff, I could turn it on and fire up a whole song that I didn't touch. And then it's just like, you know what I mean? Like I can go on splice and get a bunch of royalty free samples that I could legitimately use and put out a commercial hit. I've, yeah. I've seen <laughs> countless people do it. I pointed out samples from, Young Ma and from all these different groups, like, yeah, that's on Splice right now. I didn't even transpose the loop. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> right, right. And legally you can do it, but it's like, how much satisfaction do you get from creating the thing yourself? You know, right. again, for me, it's like, I, I don't want to be judgmental because it's not my place to judge. Mm -hmm. But for all the things I had to go through to learn how to get my sound out, I feel like people aren't really benefiting from that journey. You right. You know what I mean? That's key. See, I think that's a good way to look at it, too. It's not necessarily judgment. It's just like, you know, there's so much benefit to I remember trying to play in you bought a guitar and a dude I knew he was cold with guitar. He was in a rock band. And I was like, yo, teach me some alternative tunings. He was like, shut up, yo, learn. <laughs> Nobody teaching you no alternative tunings. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody giving you a cheat sheet. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's real. That's good. Real. That, that's dope. That's dope. So how do we uh, and, and in that you I, I see that, you know, you came up uh, in, in the, the artist fashion and, you know, kind of doing things that artists do and, and developing and growing. And eventually you kind of embraced the, the sort of teacher in you. And I see that you're Ableton, a certified Ableton live trainer. How'd that come about? Um, that's a funny story. Uh, a homie of mine uh, named Heinz, uh, Heinz Buchanan. I don't know if you're watching out there, Heinz. Peace to you, man. Uh, he was doing some stuff with a company called Celimony. Uh, And I remember he had a badge for Nam. Somehow he was able to get me a badge for Nam. Mm -hmm. And I went there and the homie Gino subtitle at the time, he's the one who introduced me to Ableton Live. I didn't know anything about Ableton Live until he showed me like a cracked version of Live 4, right? Mm -hmm. And he was like, check it out. And I remember I messed around with it for like a couple of days and didn't understand it. And I would just put it away for like a month. And then I got back on it and was like, you know what? Because I'm stubborn like that. So I was like, I'm going to mm -hmm. figure this out. Right. So I started right. messing around and like I basically used the session view like a glorified. Um, I don't know. I, I was I was cutting up samples in the session. view. That's basically how I was using it. Yeah. So long story short, I go to Nam. Uh, I ended up meeting this dude named Dave Hill Jr., who at the time was like the vice president of business operations for Ableton. Okay. And at the time, Ableton's U.S. office was in New York. So 
we chopped it up. He came out to my spot. I was staying in Atwater, uh, Atwater Village at the time in, in uh, Cali, in L.A. And he came out to my spot. He was like, I'm curious about how you're using Ableton Live. So I showed him what I was doing, and he was like, this is just unorthodox, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, this is really interesting, and I like what you're doing. And I don't know if I ended up doing a presentation for them at NAM first. Mm -hmm. Something like that. But he, he introduced me to the dude who uh, who owned and, and ran Dubspot, uh, Dan Giovi. And uh, at that point, I can't go into the specifics of how I got certified because it's still like, you know, kind of hush hush. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I was given quite a bit of love and I, mm -hmm. I got invited to a certification event. Um, you know, Laura Escude? No. So Laura Escude, she um, she's oh, well, like, she is, she the one. She's like the first woman to be. Yeah. Yeah. I met her just this year at NAMM. OK, yeah. She, she was the first ever trainer. She was yeah, she the first was ever trainer. Exactly. I remember I remember they introduced me to her at NAM that way. <laughs> OK, yeah. so so she was the one. It was her and another dude. Uh, I think his name was Ali. But okay. Laura's the main person I remember. And they led the certification event that I was a part of. This was in 2009, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a trip. Basically, I didn't think I was going to pass the thing. I was nervous. I'd messed up the first day, came back the second day and redeemed myself. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, Laura was super cool and real supportive. And I ended up getting certified, you know. Okay. So at that point, I was like, all right, I got the certification. I need to do something to justify having this. So mm -hmm. I started doing this uh, biweekly free workshop series at a movie theater downtown in L.A. called the Downtown cool. Independent. OK. And it was dope because the guy who owned the theater happened Is to be like. There? Uh, it was there last time I was in LA. I haven't been back in LA for yeah, like two years. I feel like that's down the street from a place called Big Man Bakes or something like that. <laughs> I think Maybe I know. It's on a, like Second and Main, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, that that's yeah. the place. I saw a really dope, a couple of really dope uh, documentaries on hip hop there. Yes, go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, it's all good. So, all yeah. right, so you see, so you know the theater then. All right, mm -hmm. so when we first did the workshop, uh, like I said, the guy who owned the theater was like a hardcore max like just a max dude he loved max right yeah um so he was really into the idea of doing a workshop i was like i want to make it free because i want to have it for all access it needs to be for the community and he was down with that so i was mm -hmm. like tight so we started doing them in this room upstairs above the theater and i found footage of the very first workshop i did it's a trip so it was like maybe 13 14 people there and it was cool the vibe was good and you know as we kept on doing them word of mouth spread i was able to get a couple sponsors involved uh, the homie uh, Sam XL uh, brought the Pure Fill sound system and did some stuff. I had Hit and Run. Uh, they were doing like silk screen and the T-shirts and stuff like that. I was able to bring in folks and have like guest artists. So it became this big thing, and we were That's able cool. to do it in the main theater. So my homie David uh, David Harrow, and is he because you said Thavius or Thavius, like David Harrow or Haro, whatever. <laughs> right. potato, it's all good, right? Yeah. Uh, but my homie David, who goes by Oicho, uh, I brought him in to do live visuals, and. Um, so we had visuals on the actual movie theater screen and it started off with like a two hour lecture. And then we had, you know, three different artists doing performances and we kept it free because with the sponsors, we were able to pay everyone who was involved. Dope. My whole thing was like, I'd been to enough shows and perform where it was like, I don't want to have people wait until three in the morning to get a couple hundred bucks if they agreed to be down. So mm -hmm. I made sure that I got money from the sponsors and was able to pay people on the spot. You show up, you're here for Dope. the night. Here's your money. You feel comfortable. Just just do your thing. I want to make sure you know you're taken care of, you know, and um, it was dope. By, That's by, really dope. The last one we did, we had a really big crowd. Uh, I remember we got some like love in L.A. Weekly, you know, in terms of just like free advertising. It was really cool. And at that moment, I realized like this feels good. Yeah. It doesn't feel yeah. selfish. You know what I mean? Yeah. You made a good point earlier where it's like, yeah, if, if I'm promoting my album, it's about me, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm on stage and I'm like, look at me do these things on stage, mm -hmm. I'm taking on this praise because you're looking at me, right? Mm -hmm. And that has its own kind of satisfaction. Certainly. It has a place. It has a place for sure, you know? Mm -hmm. But to be able to like see people really appreciate that you're giving them something that they can take and go that much further with, mm -hmm. that's a whole different thing. Especially now when I'm seeing people I taught six, seven, eight, ten years ago yeah. And they're doing dope stuff. You know, they're putting out records on Dimac or they're doing whatever. Or like, you know, we talked about the homegirl Traversy that you're doing stuff yeah. with. And, you know, it, it's cool because it's like I saw these people early on in their journey and I mm -hmm. played whatever little role that I did. And mm -hmm. to see them go on and do more stuff, I know that I was a positive contribution, no matter how big or small. And that feels good. It feels great. It yeah. feels great. You know, so it's really yeah. dope.
really dope. So do you think, uh, well, well, do you, let me ask you, you, I've seen it. You've taught it a few different places too, right? Like, uh, Dubspot and, uh, Mac, uh, pro yeah, the, video, Mac yeah, pro was, audio with it. Dubspot was the main place I started teaching at. Um, mm -hmm. and then, um, another place in LA beat lab Academy. Uh, I did some stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mac pro video. I've been doing like a bunch of online courses and stuff for them. Uh, there's a place called Noise Lab, NoiseLab.io is like mm -hmm. the main place I'm doing stuff for now. Okay. We're starting like this three or four month boot camp thing next week. Uh, if you're interested, go sign up, NoiseLab.io. Um, <laughs> <No doubt. laughs> I'm going to plug the work, man. Yeah. Uh, who else? There's uh, a school in New York that I was teaching at for about two years called the Fox Grove, which is recently uh, shut down. Um, but that was a really appreciated gig because, um, you know, at the time I needed it, the dude who was running it. Um, gave me an opportunity and, and we ran with it for as long as we could you know there's another school that i'm teaching at now called the electronic music collective uh which is also based in manhattan um and then i do private lessons and one-on-ones I'm, I'm constantly teaching you know yeah. developing curriculum yeah. and, and teaching so dope that's really dope man um uh that's important work too and so the, how much of that informed the release technology like really dope concept i remember when you were doing it a couple years ago and i remember seeing it like damn that concept is ill and not only was the concept ill but then this <laughs> you know what i'm saying no, that like, artwork is nuts. It's just, yeah the artwork is just sort of bananas man like yeah. it like it, that was <laughs> this is really dope tell me about like how that album and the the concept and even the artwork and stuff how did you kind of conceptualize all that well, you know, it's funny. The name actually came from um, what was the game I was playing? Uh, what was it Fallout? Maybe Fallout Three, Fallout New Vegas, something like that. Okay. Because um, I'm a, I'm a bit of a gamer. I don't game that much, but I used to game like pretty hardcore. I like like single player open world RPG stuff. So like, <laughs> you know, Fallout. You're in this like old like you know post nuclear wasteland, and there's these computer terminals that you got to hack sometimes, right? Right. So there's this hacking game that you got to play where like there's a bunch of different you know words, and you got to pick which ones amongst all these different symbols. And I remember there was one line and it said technology, but the way it was written, it was techno te technolog, mm -hmm. and then the Y was on the other line, right? Uh, and I, I saw it and I was like, oh, that's dope. That's technology, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I've been teaching all this time. I hadn't put out a record in a long time. And I just thought the play on words was cool. You know, it's it's technology. It is. It's kind of brilliant. I was like, damn, that's dope. <laughs> I was kind of surprised no one had done it before, honestly, you know? Yeah, so, it's was really dope. No, thank you, man. And the way that the songs came about, um, you know, another person I haven't actually mentioned, Saul Williams is a cat that I work with, uh, you know, I guess over the course oh, of, yeah. man, I, yeah, yep. Yeah. I've known that dude for how long now? 16, 17? I don't know. We've known okay. each other for quite a while, you know. Dope. And um, I produced on a couple of his records. Uh, I remember he, uh, he brought me on to, to tour with him in like, what, 2004, 2003, 2004, something like that. We toured together for a while, and then my youngest, uh, my oldest son, uh, was born, and I ended up not touring with him anymore. You know, not not for any other reason than just like you know, I, I guess it was time to like stay at home and be a dad or whatever. So uh, we ended up reconnecting later, um, maybe a year or two before I started working on this record. Mm -hmm. And um, all the songs were basically the result of me just recording stuff in hotel rooms, you know, and, and coming up with different ideas and being inspired, being inspired by being on the road with Saul and just kind of seeing how he was doing his stuff. Because when I first worked with them back in the day, you know, again, I had I had a whole different impression of who I was supposed to be in the realm of music. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. ego was in a different place and I was just like, whatever. So I appreciated working with Saul, but like I didn't really get what he was doing to get himself in that position. And I just took it for granted, ultimately, you know, so right. once we got back together and I'm kind of just seeing like how hard this dude is hustling and all the different dots he's connecting and just the place that he's, you know, the level of status he's been able to attain by carving his own path. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a trip when you see like, you know, he's probably one of the most well-known and prominent poets of our era. Without, and, without a doubt, without a doubt. And I just didn't really get that. I didn't get the fact that I had a chance to like kick it in, in politic and, and work with this dude and have his ear and have him respect me. And it's like, this dude is getting phone calls from all types of super famous baller, whatever. And mm -hmm. he's making time for me to work with them. You know, like I didn't really yeah. get that. So yeah. once we got back together, I had a new appreciation and I had like a whole different level of inspiration just from seeing him operate, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So a lot of what I was working on for this record just came from that. Like, you know, thanks for bringing me on the road. I got time in a hotel. Let me work on something. We just did a gig that was dope. I feel good. Let me put it into this idea, you know? So Right, right. Um, okay. Yeah. Really dope. Really dope. Actually, that's, that's kind of cool to know that. I remember um, the first time I came across Saul was very, oh, man, what's this? It was the 90s. <laughs> and it was it was a movie he made, and I can't remember the name Slam. of the movie. Slam. Slam, yeah. Yep, that's the when same I thing. Slam, my first I was kind of enamored with the idea of like, yo, he this poet, and, and you know, at the time too, uh living in Chicago, there was um a basement bookstore. Um and I can't remember the name. I mean, what's it called? The Underground? I'm not sure. I can't remember the name, but they would have poetry slams in this bookstore all the time. And it was just a really interesting time. And I ended up working with one of the more well-known poets <clears throat> in Chicago at the time. And I was early on, you know, starting to make beats and and um, me and him would get in the studio and he would do poetry to, to some of the beats. And then I saw Slam and I was like kind of mind blown. And I've always paid attention to Saul ever since. Uh, so that's kind of cool that like your involvement with him kind of, uh, help give birth to some of the concepts that you were working with in this, in this, uh, technology joint. Yeah. No, Saul is, is that dude is, is a beast, man. Like it's, it's, it's hard for me to really express just like how much stuff that dude does mm -hmm. and does well, you know? Yeah. And it, it's, and again, it's, it's not even a thing where it's like, I've never been like really deep into spoken word. I, I never approached, I'm just not really a fan like that. You know what I mean? Like I, I worked at Amoeba Records in, in Hollywood when it first opened up. We'd have all types of different celebrities come in there. And I never really got starstruck. There was only like two instances I can remember. Like, again, working with Saul, I remember we had a situation. We were in a studio with Nas. And Nas and Saul had the same manager at that time. And mm -hmm. I just happened to be in the studio. And they were like, all right, we're going to do a remix for the song. And I had a beat. And Saul was like, we want to use your beat. And Nas was <laughs> down for it. And, you know, it was just a trip because, like, they were trying to do, like, a hot, you know, a, a, a basically a, a something that would be a single for New York radio. Dope. And I gave him this, like, dirty-ass, aggressive, like, just dark beat. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, nah, son. But, I mean, they did the song. Like, the song is official. You know, like, it's, yeah. it's out there. You can find it. Nas rapping on one of my beats, you know, yeah. news with Khalees. That's um, dope. But that was one time when I was like, oh, shit, that's Nas. And I'm mm -hmm. in the studio with this dude. And I remember one of his boys was with him and had a jar full of Cohiba cigars and offered me one. It's like, I'd never smoked a Cohiba, but I was like, I, I felt like I had to take one. Cause it's oh, like, of course. See, this is a momentous occasion. Light it up. I'm <laughs> familiar with Nas, right? That's right. I'm hoping this shit all wrong in front of him, but yeah. So. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it's a God smoke. Right? It was funny. Cause I remember his boy looking at me like, you don't know what you're doing, but he didn't say anything. Right. That's funny, man. No doubt. But um, no, it was a trip just because, you know, Saul opened up a lot of opportunities for me to like experience stuff that I never would have mm -hmm. and has always appreciated what I brought to the table, you know? Right, right. Um, so it was dope. So so that's what I mean is like, you know, he knew that I wasn't like some jocker, yes man, like, oh my God, I love everything you do. Because mm -hmm. it was never about that. It was more about like this mutual respect of I see what you're doing, you see what I'm doing, you know that I'm here to just help aid you and benefit what you're doing. I'm not trying to steal the limelight. It's not about me. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sure that you can do what you got to do. You That's know? dope. That's brotherhood. Ultimately, yeah. Yeah, you know? really is what it comes down to. You kind of looking out for, for each other that way and kind of, and him also sharing his platform to a degree with you. You know what I mean? That, that's brotherhood. Oh, he looking, he's looking out. That's really dope. Because the reality is, is that Saul didn't ever really need me to go on stage with him. You know? <laughs> right, and that was another right. thing that I really had to remember too is like, mm -hmm. You know, it'd be different if I'm sitting up here playing like a super essential instrument that he can't do anything with on his own. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here playing beats and parts of songs that have already been. He could have gone off of that. He could have just press played on his computer. <laughs> right. He really didn't need me. So the fact that he was even willing to include me like that consistently. Yeah. Again, like my appreciation for it later in life got much, much bigger because I understood what that was about. Where before I didn't, you know, that's dope. I could appreciate that, man. That's really dope. So, um, and, and that was 2017 technology came out. What's, what's kind of on the docket going forward for, you, you? know, it, it's a trip, man, because, um, I've, I've never been like the most, uh, I guess, active artist when it comes to releasing stuff. I've always had several years between records. Uh, I get that. 
Yeah, technology. I did that after what the record I did before that came out of maybe what 2011, the most beautiful <laughs> ugly. Um, and I'm sitting on so much music, but none of it is like in the format of an album, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. And I guess at this point, what it really is is like there's a lot of different directions I could go. You know, on on the one hand, I want to do like a super aggressive, noisy, almost like screaming type record. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I want to just do like some just like just some hip hop loops, just like some dope vibey type stuff. Um, but most of the music I do is sample based mm -hmm. and I don't have a budget to clear these samples. Right. Not, right, right. You know, and, and I'm not trying to do something janky and shady mm -hmm. and I'm old enough now to appreciate the musicianship that goes into the records that just get sampled nonstop. Yeah. And I'm not just trying to be that dude ripping off somebody and be like, I made this song when it's a two bar loop that I didn't really add nothing to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's respectable, man. I mean, and that's, you know, that's uh, coming from a musician's perspective, really, I think. I remember the the I, I was in the studio at one point and this dude was playing me records that records what well, we were trying to we the point was to sample them but there was a couple of joints where he was like no this is too dope we, it's so special we not sampling it <laughs> because it's just too special it gave me a different appreciation for stuff like that no definitely in fact I, I'll give you another little anecdote I remember uh the homegirl uh Ilea Perse F1 I don't know if you're out in Houston watching but if you are what's up uh I remember I was staying at her spot Perse F1 a really dope MC she's got a whole okay. just unique just vibe really dope style and I remember we were kicking it and she was playing me uh it was the first time I ever heard Little Dragon and she was playing me that song twice by Little Dragon are you familiar with the with the group no no if you get a chance uh the song is called Twice it's the song that blew them up and uh, I think it was featured in like Grey's Anatomy or some TV show. It was okay. like, it's the whole reason the band blew up. The music for it is so like ridiculously simple, but incredible. It's like the most, if you hear that song and don't feel some kind of way, like then you're just dead inside, basically. You know? <laughs> and I heard it and the music is basically just a piano. It's a piano with like, I don't know, like three or four notes just over and over and over again, but it's the most hypnotic loop. And the way she sings on it is beautiful. And I remember my first thought hearing it, I was like, oh, this would be dope with some drums on it. Mm -hmm. And I remember Aaliyah looked at me and was like, well, why would you put drums on it? And again, <laughs> it was one of those things where I didn't really get it until later. Like, yeah, putting drums on it would kill the whole vibe. That The whole thing that makes it beautiful is that is the emptiness. Yeah, yeah, because there's, there's um, uh, I hate to, that I actually quote things like this, but things that I hear that I've heard like brings in this kind of moment, it reminds me of what Miles, Herbie said something about Miles one time about the music, the, the music and the space of the notes. Yep. Like that emotes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, Definitely. I get that. I get that. <clears throat> and, and I spent a lot of time, I, I guess, you know, making things that were really dense because mm -hmm. I was always into this idea of like this aggressive wall of sound and in your face and whatnot. Yeah. And and I've 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 started to really appreciate stripping things down more and leaving more space and being yeah. able to you know, uh, uh, appreciate the tension before shit gets crazy. Yeah. Even if that tension builds up and you never get the release from that one song, maybe the payoff is two or three songs later in the album, you know? Right, right, right. So it's just, I'm not really at a point now where I'm thinking about conceptually making an album that fits where I'm at in terms of what I want to hear. Okay. I got a gang of dope beats. I got I got probably six, seven hundred dope beats on my hard drive yeah, yeah. that I don't really have an outlet for. You know, like if I got MCs to work with, if I got vocalists, like, you know, I'm not tripping. I'm not even trying to, like, come up and be rich off of this stuff. Yeah. I've got a pretty decent living from teaching and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just a matter of having the right people that fit the vibe and aren't going to just, like, slander the work. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm not actively seeking those folks out. So, like, you know, I'm things will happen as they happen. You know, I, I believe in fate. I believe in, you know, things happen for a reason. And that's what brought me to New York, you know? So, um, and you're you know, yeah, there you go. You're in New York now. How long you been in New York? Uh, four, four and a half years. Okay. Okay. And that's after being in LA for 20 years. And so what, it got you, what, what brought the transition on? I mean, ultimately, you know, again, I was in LA for 20 years. Okay. Right? And well, I didn't choose to move to LA. Okay. You know, I, <laughs> no doubt. And, and that, that's nothing like it's, it's not about a diss to the city. No, no like, I get it. You, know, well, you, you were a teenager. I was 16. And so you go where the family goes or whatever the circumstances that takes you there. I get it. Right. And yeah. to be honest, like after 20 years in L.A., I met a lot of good people. I made some good homies. I got a few friends for life uh, that I made there. But mm -hmm. it never felt like home and I never felt yeah. comfortable. And I always felt like just like 
like an outsider, you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, and part of that is just my personality, really. I'm anti-social. I don't really like to fuck with people if I don't have to. That's just kind of my vibe. <laughs> right. But it right. felt like it was even more disadvantage, you know, dis what uh it worked more to my disadvantage, you know, like I'll put it that way, you know. <laughs> so I just needed a change of pace. And honestly, like I was talking to Saul about it when we were on tour. I was like, I want to move out the country, I want to move to the south of France, mm -hmm. I want to do this and do that. And as romantic as that sounded, it wasn't realistic. Mm -hmm. But I had always wanted to live in New York at some point in my life. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wasn't ready for it until I was ready for it. It was calling me. Like the city was literally calling me. And on a whim, it was just like, fuck it, you know, packed up, threw everything in the car, literally drove five days across the country from Pasadena to Brooklyn. Wow. Found the dope spot. And here we are. That's, that's the next album, Pasadena to Brooklyn, yo. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's dope, man. And hey, so on that note, I usually don't do these longer than an hour. We're about 10 minutes old, but it's such a good conversation. Um, on that note, I'm gonna, we'll end it right there. If there's anything you want to leave the viewers with and uh, would you anything you want to kind of drop on them or uh, say in closing, now's the time. Um, I mean, you know, again, I appreciate the platform. You're a real cool cat. I'm sure we'll like we will be building and politic and more after this. Without a doubt. Um, as far as everybody, you know, if, you, if you're out there watching and whatnot, you know, I've got music that you can find on Spotify and Apple Music and whatever. But, um, you know, I like to just share and geek out with folks. You know, I'm easy to find. My name is very easy to Google. So if you're curious about anything in terms of my music lessons, you want to find me on IG or Facebook or whatever. Uh, just look up Thavius Beck. I'm not hard to find. You know, um, I just encourage everybody to just, you know, figure out what your voice is and what you want to contribute to the world and spend your time on earth doing it. Yeah, that's what's that's up. Really it. Dope. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, bro. Um, I appreciate you too, man, for sure. And as we as we roll out, was there, uh, I'm going to play another one of your joints from the album, uh, uh, Technology. Is there one that I should should go out with? You know what? Uh, yeah. What am I Actually, my favorite track on that album, even though I wore out the Amen break, but I don't care. Uh, it's a song called <laughs> I Cannot Ten. So, uh, yeah, let, let's oh, go out with that. We'll get it's all funny. I'm sitting here looking right at that one because of the, the name. So before we get started, here's the thing. I've always been into Egyptology. As an MC, my my stage name that I grew up with was Fashara. And the, oh. it's a, the letters of three names as I was exploring Islam. And the first of it is P-H-A, Pharaoh. And so that's another reason why I relate to this. And I was so like, yo, that's dope. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, uh, the, I love the, the whole kind of Egyptology vibe and that kind of stuff, too. Uh, so, yeah, man, thanks for, for being on the show. We're definitely going to build some more. And I'm sure I'll pass across. And um, I'm going to play this. Uh, I can attend and we're going to roll out. Definitely. Black Tech Talk. Thanks a lot, man. Yes, indeed. Break, 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 yeah. 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 I can break feet, I break feet and make them say y'all men. Who be? I'm an OG like I can attend. Like a soul from a test floor, yes, sir, there ain't no stopping. I only ascend, fall in and not an option. Meanwhile, careers rain and fall like rain in the fall drop in. This is how the legal bubble the first when reality can't pop in. The word is not my concern, get it over the ashes. If a vote doesn't play, then maybe they came from the fucked up batches. I'll burn like a supernova, all they got is a pack of wet matches. When opportunity struck the door, I got a master game for all lots and latches. <laughs> Break 
Till I break, then I make them say amen. Amen. amen Cool me, I'm an OG like I cannot tell Rock and soul to the best mode, yes sir, there ain't no stop in I only ascend, fall in is not an option Fall in is not an option yeah man that makes me happy man <laughs> that's the cut <laughs> i dig it so Look yeah up, say peace man and thanks for joining us on the show we'll chat again Definitely, man. Definitely. Take care, y'all. Peace and love, everybody. Stay safe. Indeed.